Welcome to this afternoon's 2017 Professor Alan Owen Lecture for the Australian Institute of Health Services Research. We are really delighted to have you here. I am uh, Paul Sadler. I'm the Chair of the Advisory Board for ASRI and uh, very pleased to be along doing the emceeing role for this afternoon. I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to elders past and present, and shortly I'll introduce Kez to do a formal acknowledgement of country. Just uh, a brief uh, mention of um, the program. You should have all picked one up as we come in. Um, after the acknowledgement of country, I'm going to invite uh, Professor Neville Owen, Alan's brother, to say a few words. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge Neville and all of the family who are here. Uh, welcome along. We're delighted to have you. And uh, also, um, it's, I think, hugely fitting that, of course, our um, lecturer for today is Professor Cathy Eager. And I will introduce her in a little while. I'm going to hand over now to Keziah Bennett Brook, who is going to do the acknowledgement of country. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet, the Wadiwadi people of the Dharawal Nation. I would like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and to those of the future. And I also acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here with us today. As we share our research and learning, may we always respect the knowledge forever embedded within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kez. Well, we are here today to honour the memory of Alan Owen. Um, Alan was a really good friend to myself and many people in this room. And uh, it's a, an honour that we've been doing this now. Kathy and I were just working it out. This is the fifth of these lectures, which means it's six years since Alan's passing. So it's uh, really fitting to uh, actually have the acknowledgement once more of the contribution that Alan made. And I'd like to ask Neville if he would come forward, Professor Neville Owen, to speak about his brother. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. Um, I'm delighted to be here and uh, I'm absolutely delighted to say a few words, a few personal words about Alan. Um, Alan would just be so thrilled to be here to hear Kathy's lecture. Um, and I mean, who knows, Alan might well be listening somewhere. Now, Alan was a, a Marxist materialist Buddhist, so we, we really don't know what happens to them, whether there's an afterlife or whether Alan would be, has been reincarnated, he could even be lurking here somewhere. Uh, Alan, at the end of his life, were, was on a lot of drugs, so he might not have been able to organise a, the best afterlife for himself. So anyway, Alan, Alan would be so pleased to be here. Um, now, as well as being a, a Marxist materialist Buddhist, Alan was an amazing sportsman. He had terrific sporting talents, amazing motor skills. As his older brother, I was a motor moron. Uh, my physical education teacher at Sydney Tech High, where Alan and I both went, uh, Mr Jordan, he would abuse me in PE classes for being a motor moron. Alan was a star. Soccer, basketball, and in fact, he was a, a state champion at track cycling. Very few people would know that. Now, that in a way flavoured a lot of how Alan approached things. You know, at university and through his career, he read widely, he really thought very broadly about social issues, but in what he did, there was always this kind of grounding back to, well, you know, what about the real world? What about the material conditions of people's lives? How do the big ideas, how do the political processes really connect with how people live and how can we make a difference? So Alan, I think, was very special in that regard. Um, the other thing, of course, with the, with the scholarly depth 
we got a kind of whimsical and ironic and irreverent sense of humour as well. So, you know, he could, you know, in the middle of, the middle of a, a Marxist harangue about something or other, he could manage to, you know, quite interestingly take the piss out of himself as he was doing that. Um, Alan was just terrific. Um, I think that that really helped him to do some wonderful things, including all those years he spent on the guardianship board, where you know, he really had to think about the big social issues, what are, we, what are we seeing here in the bigger picture, but at the same time, you know, what about these people? You know, what, what about you know, these poor buggers who were written into their parents' will as, as a gift to a friend, as a, as a slave? What do we do about that? Now, Alan was amazing in terms of being able to pull together those big threads and those more immediate threads about real life. And I think you know, that comes out of this mixture of you know, the sporting, the practical, you know, the getting ev all 25 of the, the cub badges. You know, Alan was just a, a very interesting and odd person that he was able to put, who was able to put this together. Now, today's lecture from Cathy is going to be about something that is, would have been very close to Alan's heart and mind. You know, really, the whole issue and the public policy, the ethical, the personal issues about end-of-life decision-making. And I think for, for me and Sue coming up from Melbourne, it's quite interesting, given that uh, the Victorian Parliament has just got their end-of-life legislation through. So we're going to see, I think, in Victoria over the next little while, a, a pretty good case study, which I hope is going to be flavoured and hopefully very well informed by a lot of the things that Cathy is going to tell us. So, Cathy, I can't wait to hear the story. Thank you. Thanks so much, Neville. Um, I was just actually thinking, I was sitting there, we, we kind of reversed roles a little bit because Neville was our first lecturer on the first uh, anniversary and I got to do what Neville just did about Alan on the first. <laughs> so what goes around comes around. Now, of course, um, there's a few of us on the, uh, the advisory board who were wondering why we didn't do this straight away. Um, and actually invite Cathy, Cathy to be the person who gives the lecture. Because uh, obviously Cathy and Alan worked together very closely and indeed uh, the then Centre for Health Services Development was really in, in many ways a creation that the two of them worked on together with, with a team of people who, some of whom are still in this room. And it's, um, I think the vision that they both had, which has led now to what we firmly believe is one of Australia's most influential uh, institutes in the area of health services in, in any university around the country. Um, a lot of that is due to Cathy's drive and her skills. We were just commenting that um, uh, one of the reasons she keeps getting approached to give lectures in this way is she's got a phenomenal capacity to take a depth of research understanding and translate it into a presentation that is actually accessible and understandable to a general audience. My day job is working in the aged care sector and ASRI is currently doing some substantial work on a new uh, costing and classification study in the area of residential aged care and historically, including in Alan's time, worked substantially in community care in similar fields. And it was always interesting to see how Cathy was one of the people who, when she did the presentations, people actually got it. They got what the message was about and what the... Um, we are looking forward, therefore, today to Cathy actually throwing some light on what is, as Neville alluded to, been a very contentious area in recent times. Um, and what Cathy will be bringing to us today is the evidence that sits behind some of the debates and maybe throwing some light on some areas that we hadn't thought of or hadn't really realised. <coughs> Will you please join me in welcoming <coughs> Cathy. Oh, 
the technology works, so that's very exciting. Um, thank you very much. Alan and I worked together uh, from our 20s, in fact, until his, his death. Um, and we had lots and lots of discussions about some of these issues when they were still theoretically interesting ideas, better discussed late at night over red wine. Um, but today they've become um, real issues. So I'm going to start by just talking about why are we talking about this. We are such a death-defying society that we all think that we're going to live forever anyway, so really this is just a theoretical idea. I am going to talk about a few numbers about death and dying in society. I'm going to talk about what that means to die in a death-defying society, which counts death as a failure. You as a patient didn't try hard enough and you as clinicians were hopeless. Um, I am going to talk about choices, and I've been really concerned that the euthanasia debate has one that says, well, you've got two choices. You can take the euthanasia option or you can go some other way. But that's actually not all the choices at end of life, and the choices are much more and I'm a health services researcher, so I will talk across the care continuum. What does that mean in the prevention space? Neville's here, so we'll talk no doubt about exercise. What happens in acute care? What happens in terms of advanced care planning? I do want to talk about palliative care because we, one of the centres we run here is the National Palliative Care Outcomes Collaboration, and I will talk inevitably about uh, euthanasia, and I will finish really talking about what choices do we have and all the way through, I really want to make a point that we make choices as individuals, but we also have to make choices as a society about the sort of society we want to be. So here's why we should talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's essentially we have no choice. And that's a really important message that we have created <coughs> such a culture that defies death that if we all jog hard enough, we're all going to live forever. And we're actually not. And this is a really, really important issue. We are filming, so if it works, we can provide this to people as well. But, but I really do like this one. And I know quite a few puppies that look just like this. And if they do have a box of chocolates, that is what happens to them. <laughs> um, I want to make a point, though, that we really have no choice. That the ageing of the baby boomers, there are increasing costs and debates about how we use those dollars that we have. We do have increasing rates of chronic disease. Alan was diagnosed as a young man with multiple myeloma, which then had a life expectancy of three years, and he lived for 15 with myeloma as a chronic disease rather than as something that killed him. I mean, he lived in it with that too, and he not just died of it. But I also want to really pick up the euthanasia debate is really reflecting a bunch of very complex social issues as well. Um, and I really want to make a point as well that we have so medicalised death that most people have no experience of it and very little awareness of the options that are available until they actually have to confront it. Um, and we just simply do give sort of statements that prevention is better than cure as though we're going to cure ourselves of death, and we're not. So I'm going to start with some death and dying statistics because I am a researcher. There's about 160,000 deaths a year in Australia, 3,500 of those in, are in the Illawarra. And about 80% of all deaths are due to just five causes. 30% of those are now due to cancer. 30% due to heart and circulatory disorders. Years ago, most people within that category died of an acute heart attack. They're only 5% now. Most people with circulatory problems are dying of chronic heart failure over years rather than dropping dead of a heart attack in the middle of dinner. Um, respiratory diseases, external causes, largely accidents and stroke, and only a very small number of deaths are unpredictable. So stroke, heart attack, accident and injuries and suicide. And I really do want to come back to the suicide statistic. But those statistics look 100% different to what it looked at the beginning of the century when we died of vaccine-preventable diseases, we died of strokes and we died of heart attacks. The, many, most of those causes now being preventable. And in doing so, we've actually convinced ourselves we can live forever. So what does it look like across the country? There's about 160,000 deaths and 3,500 of those are in the Illawarra. 
and about 100,000 of those deaths are predictable and about 60,000 are not. And despite all the statistics that you see quoted, the hospital death rate has remained largely unchanged for a decade. About 50% of people will die in hospital and 50% out of hospital. And of the 50% who die in hospital, about 80,000, about 20,000 will get palliative care, but about 30,000 will die in other specialists, under other specialists, some of whom are really good at end of life and some of whom are really lousy at it. And about 30,000 will die in emergency departments and in intensive cares and so on. <clears throat> and out in the community, the picture's not dissimilar. About 20,000 people in the community will receive palliative care about 30,000 will die predictable deaths largely under the care of a GP and about 30,000 will die on roads and swimming pools and all the other places that people have accidents. And of our 160,000 deaths a year, uh, 60,000 of them occur in residential aged care. And Paul mentioned the project that we're doing. Um, there's 150,000 residential aged care beds in the country, 200,000 people going in them. The average age at entry now is 85, the average life expectancy is two years, and a third of the whole residential aged care population will die each year. And that's not a statistic that we're used to and that we can't actually accommodate that in thinking about euthanasia, where 60,000 of our 160,000 deaths are frail old people in residential aged care, not because it's a lifestyle choice, but because they are now so frail they can no longer live independently. And I think what we've seen in the euthanasia debate are two very extreme views. On the one hand, and this is really how the media portrays this, every week we see life-saving procedures and miracle cures. Every headline coming out of science journals <coughs> is about the new cure for something or other. But on the other hand, the health system has been portrayed very much for the euthanasia debate, a system, a system which is either unable or unwilling to relieve pain and suffering and left in unbearable pain, people have no choice but to elect euthanasia. <coughs> and neither of those two extremes is right. And it's really important, I think, in a very polarised debate that we come back to the middle and understand that those extremes do exist for some people, but they are the minority at the extremes, and I'm really talking about at the 2% extremes, not the experience of the 98. So in terms of choices now, I do want to go through the choices, and they're not just do I take the euthanasia option or not. I do want to raise a set of choices that are not mutually exclusive, and they're ultimately about the values that we, the, the things we value. And that's why we need to be having conversations with our families now and not later on. And the choices are about sequencing and about making trade-offs and they're very complex issues for individuals and for societies. And I'm going to start with prevention, partly because Neville is here and Neville is a, a distinguished professor at the Baker Institute who spent his whole life getting us to all stand up and, and not sit down and keep walking. But I want to go back to something that Alan and I started to talk about in the 80s and 90s, which was a theory that was called the compression of morbidity. So mortality is what kills you, and morbidity is what makes you sick. So the theory of morbidity, the compression of morbidity, was first proposed back in 1980, and this has been used as the economic justification for prevention for the last 30 years. And this is the idea that about 1950, about, when you're about 55 back then, people started to develop the early signs of what became chronic conditions that would then stay with them for, on average, 21 years before they died. And the last three of those years, you'd be really a very high user of the health system. So the argument for the investment in prevention says what we can do is we can compress the morbidity period, the time in which you are unwell. And it won't be 21 years, which is the top graph, we can get that down in the bottom graph that you be, can start to become unwell or start to develop arthritis and pain and all the other things associated with old age um, when you're about 65 and you'll go through to about 78, so we'll compress it down to 13 years from 21 and we'll save all this money 
And isn't prevention a jolly good idea? But the problem is, 30 years later, that all we've done, just like some of our politicians, is we've shifted to the right. <laughs> <laughs> we've actually, people at the, the, the onset of chronic problems has actually shifted on average at least five years. But on the other hand, we've actually extended life as well by at least five years, and on average, that 20-year period hasn't changed in 40. <clears throat> and that's a really big issue. And one of the things we've seen in the last 40 years in terms of my epidemiology colleagues is we now have much more dementia than we had 40 years ago. And this is really, my economics colleagues would call this the opportunity cost. I didn't die of a heart attack. I did wear my seat belt. I didn't get drunk and, and go under a dray. And now I'm living old enough to get dementia. And that's really why I think we need to stop being a death-defying society. There's all sorts of reasons that we might want to invest in prevention, but that's about quality, and it's not an economic argument. The economics actually doesn't hold up. So that takes me to acute care, and here is the problem child, I think. Um, so acute care is a really simple idea. Person gets sick, you go and see a doctor, get a treatment, typically that's a pill, we love those. You get better, you're cured, and you live a long and happy life. Yes, well, that's the theory. Of it. And that, of course, is the basis of a lot of media coverage, but that's the role of the healthcare system. And I, here's the rub. It is a bit too good to be true, but I do like some of these, and never, I particularly like the bottom one, um, which is from an academy of, of one of the, the medical colleges that's now describing exercise as a miracle cure and the role of the doctor in promoting it. Well, the sponsor by like Coca-Cola. Of course. Well, I think most of us would probably prefer the cocaine toothache drops, but... <laughs> or perhaps Dr Mario is doing better. But that whole media around miracle cures and we can avoid issues is, is really, I think, a very important part of our culture now and something we really have to start thinking about. I do want to make an obvious point, which I think underpins a lot of the euthanasia debate, that a lot of acute care is futile. That we couch acute care in terms of hopes and possibilities Nobody has treatment for cancer, we fight it. And that's really a part of the language. Imagine describing it, I'm fighting my broken leg. We wouldn't do that, but we fight cancer. He never gave up, he fought it to the end. Everybody has a right to acute care, even if it's ineffective, especially if you've got private health insurance. You have a right to a lot more of futile care than if you don't have it. Um, <laughs> And you're going to believe you get value for money for it too. Um, and, but also a whole language, if we can't give up, there's a glimmer of hope, there's a glimmer of hope. And I think what we do when we do that is two things. For the person, we create a lot of guilt. I did, I'm not fighting hard enough, I'm getting sicker. And for the society, we do couch death as a failure. And in doing so, I think we deny people really important time at the end of their life to get unfinished business done and to make choices about the sorts of care and support and people that they want around them that really help them to achieve quality of life over duration. And the reason I've got my little note at the bottom is that I've been very, very actively following the euthanasia debate. And when people, they always start off with, Mary Smith had this terrible time and blah, 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 and there's a whole very awful story. And nearly every one of those awful stories is not about what happens in palliative care. It's about what happens when people continue to receive acute care well beyond the point that it's being effective, where we are denying the obvious choices that that person needs to make. And we're so busy doing clinical interventions that are futile that we're not helping people manage their pain and symptoms until they really are in strife. And I really think we need to come back and address that very core issue 
as part of thinking about euthanasia and the choices we want to make at end of life. And we need to be thinking about that, not just at the system level, but about the conversations we need to be having in our families about when is the point that we say acute care enough is enough. Because I think we are such a death-defying society that we are really doing damage to people and their families at end of life at people's most vulnerable points when they're often not able to make good choices. And Spike said it pretty well. <laughs> this is Spike Milligan. I told you I was sick. That we really need to be... And Spike, of course, was actually died in 2002, for those who are Spike Milligan fans. But he really, when you go back to some of that early humour, we really nabbed it in one right back then. So that takes me on from acute care to advanced care planning. And this is a really simple idea that you should work out what you want before you need it and before it's an emotional topic and when it's an easy topic to have a conversation about. And we also don't get people doing that early enough. And when people think about advanced care planning, they think about it in terms of, do I want to be resuscitated? The idea that you don't want to be resuscitated and have somebody fracture your ribs resuscitating with a no-brainer. But that's actually at the extreme end of an advanced care plan. The biggest questions are around, do I want my flu vaccination? Do I actually want antibiotics anymore? Do I want all sorts of other treatments? About At what point do I want to say, I'm not going to have another round of chemotherapy or radiotherapy or whatever it is. I'm not going to have surgery at this point. So I'm just pointing out from this slide that New South Wales and the other jurisdictions are all moving into this. New South, this is a, a, a website you can go to in New South Wales, making an advanced care directive. We're also seeing people starting to produce electronic apps. You can have one on your phone showing what your advanced care plan is. And more importantly, it's not the document or it's not the thing on your app. It's that you've had your conversation in your family, not just about your wishes, but about the values. Nobody can an anticipate every possible situation you can be in. But a conversation that's value-based, I value the quality of my life over the duration, or I want to live as long as possible no matter what, that's a really important conversation to be having with your family before you need it, because it's too emotionally draining to have it too much later. So that's advanced care planning, and that's another really important choice. And I think one of the people, one of the problems I've got with some of the people involved in the euthanasia debate is that they're really happy to skip this step and move straight on to the next. But this, I think, is the conversation we need to have with the people we love and I put these pluses and minuses about what, for me, I think is important. And we'd all ab agree that an intervention that adds to the duration of your life and adds to the quality is really the, the really key idea. We're all happy with that. And we'd also equally agree that an intervention that made your quality of life worse and the duration shorter, that's not a great idea either. We don't like that one. We'd all agree at the extreme. But the conversations we need to be having are about the trade-offs in the middle. And people, I think, often think about advanced care planning in terms of the extremes rather than the bits in the middle. And for most of us, it's going to be in the middle that the choices are going to be. How much, you know, how much longer do I want to live if I have this intervention which might actually increase my pain or distress every day? Those sorts of conversations are really important. So that takes me to palliative care. And our data are very clear now. Only about 40% of people in Australia who would benefit from palliative care are currently receiving it. And if we start to talk about the ethics, I think in terms of the ethics of the healthcare system, that's a pretty fundamental issue. Unlike the way that it's been portrayed in the media, the evidence is overwhelming that palliative care is really effective for those who get it. But the key is to get it. We also have some evidence that I think is really, really more worrying. 
there is better access for palliative care in wealthy areas, and rich people get more palliative care than poor people, and people who are middle class Caucasians get more palliative care than people who don't speak English, or people who are Aboriginal, or people who live in regional and remote Australia. We actually have data now internationally showing that those who get palliative care actually live longer than those who don't. That living in pain and living with breathing distress is actually really exhausting and managing symptoms and pain well can actually add time. We also have evidence that palliative care is cheaper less un unnecessary diagnostic tests and invasive procedures and use of intensive care. And the intensive care is still around four, you know, $4,500 to $6,000 a day. Very expensive stuff. Um, the other thing that's really important is some, some research out of South Australia, which is from population surveys, and they've, they've actually demonstrated that outcomes for carers are still significantly better at two years between families where the person died in palliative care versus those who didn't. And where the measure is how long after the person died did it, ta did it take you to be able to get back into the normal day-to-day -day living, to get back to work, to get back into your normal role. And those differences didn't start to close for two years. So if you start to think about the economic impact of that, the argument for palliative care for everyone who needs it is a no-brainer. But we don't do it. <coughs> so the, at the personal level, these are the sorts of issues that I think are really important about palliative care. What matters to me? What unfinished business do I have and how do I get it done? <coughs> what trade-offs am I prepared to make? And that's about whether I want to be at home or in hospital, what levels of medication I want. And I think if we've heard some of the euthanasia debate, you've heard people describe it, good heavens, this person felt pain they shouldn't have without recognising that people who are dying have a right to make choices. And some of those choices are, I don't want that medication. Or I don't want to do that. I want to be at home even if I've got more problems than if I went to hospital because home's more important to me, or vice versa. So in terms of hospital or home, public survey, surveys where you go off and ask a general population, including a bunch of 17-year-olds who've never known anyone to get sick, typically find that 75% of us would like to die at home. Would you like to die at home? Yes, I would. Good idea. Um, when you actually survey people who are, and ask people who are living with that experience, the, the position, the data are really quite different. That patients and families change their minds several times through the course of the illness. That older people are much happier to be in hospital than at home. And that pain and symptom, feeling free from the distress, is actually substantially more important than location. And that the best care is when we give people the option of moving between hospital and home based on where they want to be and where they need to be at any one day, rather than thinking, as we're often doing now, that being at home is a good death and being in hospital is a bad death. It's actually not the case. Um, the other factor that's relevant to my next point is that the single best predictor of whether you'll die at home is who else sleeps under your roof. <coughs> And in the last census, there were 400,000 people in Australia, over 75, who now live alone. And if anybody believes that they're going to have a nice, peaceful desert, death at home, looking out the window wistfully into the hills, like in the way that we've described it in a Jane Eyre novel, it ain't going to happen. Um, I also want to make another point, and I'm about to move on and show you two slides about this. People who are in hospital have actually much better pain and symptom control than people who are at home. And we really need to be, again, this is one of the trade-offs. This is what it looks like from our, we have 250,000 people in our database, 50,000 in the last couple of years. This is what it looks like for inpatients and the dark bars are the percentage reporting severe distress when they begin their palliative care in an inpatient unit. 
and you'll see that the most common symptom is fatigue. I want to do these things, but I don't have any energy. Guess what? Dying is hard work. Fatigue is the most commonly reported symptom and isn't pain. And the light blue is the last assessment that these are self-rated from patients, the symptom assessment scale. And if I look at pain, which is the one that gets all the attention, on average, 9% of patients across inpatient units will report severe pain at the beginning of an inpatient admission and 2% at the end. And that's very different than the percentages that are talked about in the media. And in that 2%, there's actually a sizable portion who say, I don't want pain control for religious reasons, or I don't want very much today because my grandkids are coming tomorrow and I want to be really alert. And guess what? They're valid choices that they should be able to make. So this is what it looks like if you were at home. In inpatient land, <laughs> symptoms decrease as you get sicker. But at home, people's symptoms get worse. And I'll pick up that the two most common are fatigue and appetite, and families actually add to the appetite problem. We say, come on, eat something, you'll feel better, when losing your appetite is actually part of dying. But we increase in distress by trying to encourage people to do things that they don't actually want or need to do. And you'll see that the others are really pretty good as well. So that's quite different to a lot of the data, including our own data, which has been quoted all through the euthanasia debate. So in terms of euthanasia now, I want to make a couple of minutes about definitions. There's three definitions we use in Australia and they mean very different things. Euthanasia is that a clinician, typically a doctor, ends the life of another person, usually by fatal <coughs> injection, but also by giving them some tablets in order to relieve suffering. And I've assumed here that we're not talking about involuntary euthanasia, where I think it would be a really good idea to bump you off for your own good. <laughs> but voluntary euthanasia. <coughs> and internationally, people will describe that as voluntary active euthanasia and distinguish that from voluntary passive euthanasia, where we'll stop feeding you or stop giving you liquid. I want to make a distinction between that and voluntary assisted suicide. So here's a situation where somebody's living with a condition they <coughs> find unacceptable. They have a lot, they have no immediate likelihood of dying. A person with motor neurone disease, multiple sclerosis, whatever. Um, and they have a life expectancy of at least more than a year. And the doctor prescribes a fatal dose of medication for the patient to take when they're ready in a takeaway dose. And that's the most common form of euthanasia in the world. And voluntary assisted dying, and this is the, the type that's been proposed both in Victoria and in Australia. The person has a terminal diagnosis. The legislation that went through in the Victorian Parliament last week remove, reduced the time of that prognosis from 12 months to six months for all but neurodegenerative conditions like MS and that sort of stuff. But for everybody else, it's less than six. Now, the logistics of this are really mind-boggling, I reckon. You've got less than six months to live. You go and see at least two doctors. You fill out 500 forms. You, get, you go to your... You get a, a facial prescription. You go and get it filled and you take it home and you take it. And the international evidence is that about a third of people who actually get a script, people really value it because they feel that they've got a fallback but a third of people never actually take that medication, but what it's done is give them peace of mind that they've got control in a situation where they otherwise feel out of control. So we really need to be having a conversation about why is it so many people feel that they need to do that, and what is it that our clinicians are saying to people that they're still really frightened, that that's what they feel that they need to do. So this is what it looks like across the world, and here it's called physician-assisted dying, so that's and versus voluntary active euthanasia. And the very, very dark colours you can see, Japan, Colombia, um, Belgium and the Netherlands actually provide both services. And in most countries, including America and a number of others, India, um, physician-assisted suicide, that is helping people with less, with, to choose to end their life, is either legal in these pinky colours, 
or not illegal. Everyone will happily turn a blind eye. It's been decriminalised, if not legalised. And this is from Georgetown University in the States, and this map changes obviously a bit all the time. So the current legal status in Australia is that this is a state and not a, t a national issue. And that's really important because both the ACT and the Northern Territory are territories, not states. They don't have the same powers as the states under our constitution. And both of them tried to introduce um, physician-assisted dying legislation and both of them were turned, overturned by national law. And we've had 30 attempts or so to introduce voluntary assisted dying legislation in Australia. The Victorian legislation is important because it's the first time at a state level that it's almost got through. Um, there have been numerous attempts, as I said, around 30. None of them have been successful yet. In New South Wales, the legislation was defeated a week or two back um, by one vote. Um, in Victoria, it got through by two votes, but it's not quite there yet. So the story in Victoria was that it finally got through the lower house by one vote only and it went to the upper house. The legislation was then changed so much where it got through after 100 hours of debate that it's now got to go back to the lower house and go through it again. And it won't take effect until the 1st of January 2019. And in the meantime, there's going to be a state election in Victoria. And if there's a change and somebody brings a legislative amendment back in, they could start the whole process again. So even though the headlines in the Melbourne Age as, as um, voluntary assisted dying approved in legislation in Victoria, it's got a way to go. What I think's been interesting about the euthanasia debate is, is that it's been so polarised. And essentially what I've seen is that people who are very pro-euthanasia talking about it in terms of individual rights and talking about individual stories, and in a parallel universe, those who have been concerned about it, talking about the impact on society and this parallel debate with not a lot of overlap. The really important issue, I think, for us as a society is do we want to treat euthanasia as a social issue or as a health issue or as both? And if so, where's the balance? And I don't think we've had that debate and I think that's one of the reasons we've had such a polarised conversation. So the pro-euthanasia groups have been saying, and this I think is the most important argument, it's my life and it's my choice and it's my right. If I wish to do this, I have a right. And none of us and anybody who's anti-euthanasia don't believe that we stroppy baby boomers are going to go away and stop being stroppy about the roles to, about our right to control our lives at the end of our lives. The baby boomers are going to work, just take that on issue one and more so. The second arguments, I think, are much worse, but that's about that people are suffering bad deaths and that palliative care cannot alleviate suffering in all cases. And I did make a comment in my institute the other day that if the orthopods could stand up and say that they have a 98% success rate, they'd be dancing in the streets. But in palliative care, we say, good heavens, what about that 2% that aren't completely out of the severe range with what we do? So we need to have that debate about what's an okay, what's a success factor. For those who are against it, it's really about the slippery slope. And the slippery slope applies in a couple of areas. If you look at somewhere like Belgium, which has much looser, in fact, euthanasia laws. Euthanasia is legal for children and they've actually had a recent case of a child being, being euthanised at the request of a parent. Um, people are now having advanced care directives and saying, if I develop dementia, I want to be euthanised. Um, I've just had finished reading a paper which was a, hundred a review of 100 consecutive cases of people applying for euthanasia for mental health problems rather than physical. So that's what these slippery slope arguments apply. I actually don't think the slippery slope one is a particularly strong argument where we're talking about voluntary assisted dying I think most people are going to die of old age before they get through the paperwork involved in voluntary <laughs> assisted dying. But the second issue I think is a really important one, and that's that for a lot of clinicians, this is just not something that they're prepared to do ethically. And just like the person dying has a right, so does the clinician. And the third is the one of safeguards, and this is particularly an issue if you look at the tsunami of dementia coming downstream, 
and that, that argument is essentially that no legislation can protect the vulnerable. And that's not that where people will be forced into it, but that they will be influenced in, into it, particularly by unscrupulous relatives, is the general argument. So here's what it looks like in the state of Oregon, in the US, and the reason I've selected Oregon is because their law is the closest to New, Zealand, to, to, um, New South Wales and Victoria. It's voluntary assisted dying only. This is 18 years of statistics and I only had 1,127 people take the option and have a look at the top five reasons. Pain isn't up there. The reason that people are choosing, in this case, voluntary assisted dying, is because they don't want to lose their independence. They no longer believe that they have quality of life. They don't want to lose their dignity. They don't want, and so that's all about self-control. But also the next one is I don't want to be a burden. And there's a very strong feminist literature around euthanasia, around what happens that when women choose euthanasia, much more around I've been a carer all my life, I don't want to be a care burden now. And they're really important issues to be having a conversation about. And the 26% who are mentioning pain are not saying they're in pain. That includes a group who are worried about it. So where am I standing? I guess I'm saying I think there are really good reasons that we have to consider euthanasia. And even if I didn't, I think it's inevitable. I don't believe that ineffective palliative care is a valid reason for euthanasia. And that's not consistent with the reasons that people are selecting euthanasia anyway. People are selecting euthanasia about independence and the sort of person I want to be at the end of my life. I do believe that euthanasia is inevitable and therefore I think the focus should be on how we <coughs> want it to work. I personally believe that euthanasia is much more a social issue than a health issue. And if I go back to those reasons, I think that's substantially part of why I think it's a social issue. And I guess I'm going to be a bit controversial by saying, well, if it's a social issue, why would we maintain a distinction between voluntary assisted suicide and voluntary assisted dying? Why do we think, well, you can make those choices if you've got a prognosis of less than six months, but not over? But the other side of that is if we're going down that path, how do we protect vulnerable people who are not just personally vulnerable, but in many cases economically vulnerable too? I do want to put this issue into perspective. This is a really, really <coughs> important issue, but it's also a very tiny issue. The current estimate says that 400 people a year will elect euthanasia in Victoria out of 40,000 deaths. 1,600 people in Australia out of 160,000 deaths. I would love it if the whole end of life population got as much media coverage as the 1,600 people likely to elect euthanasia we get in any one year, we'd be doing much better as a society <laughs> if we were thinking about everybody at end of life rather than about a very small cohort. I do want to make an obvious choice, an obvious statement, and that's whatever we choose, we have no choice but to make choices. This issue isn't going to go away. And it's not just at the level of individuals, it's about the choices about the health system we want and also the society we want. <coughs> the other thing I should have said about the euthanasia is that whilst I'm comfortable with the idea, I'm really opposed to what's called integrated euthanasia in the international literature, which is that it's one of the options in a palliative care unit. And the reason I'm really opposed to it is that the most common fear that people have coming to palliative care is that they're going to be euthanised against their wishes. And so we would actually do more harm than good by having an integrated approach, at least for the foreseeable future when a lot of people don't want to go to palliative care because they see it as a, as a referral to die and something that's going to already hasten their death. And that's, again, how do we trade off 
of the needs and rights of the people who choose euthanasia versus others who choose really strongly not to have it. So, I do want to make this point here. I think it was James Cagney, wasn't it? None of us are now the here alive. Um, I do want to say that I think it's really important that part of what we need to do in this overall debate is we need to stop thinking about the success of the health system by how long people wait in the emergency department or how many people are on the elective search waiting list. They're really easy metrics and every state and territory has those sorts of metrics and health ministers get obsessed about them and when the elective surgical waiting list goes out, there's every election there's more promises and more money for that sort of stuff. I think we need to start judging our health system and our society as well, not just by elective surgery, but actually that's not even important, but really about how we care for people at end of life. This is my last slide. And, and, and Alan was a great John Cleese fan, so I thought I should actually end by making an obvious conversation that life is nothing more than a sexually transmitted terminal disease um, in an Alan Owen tradition. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Well, I, I hope you agree that my summary of how Cathy would go was pretty accurate. I think. Um, thanks so much, Cathy. Now we do have some time for some questions of Cathy, if you uh, have them. There's one up the back, I can see. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to go back to a point on one of your slides where you talked about uh, doesn't you talked about care as two years after the yep. person had died following palliative care. Yep. Is there any link to those people who died having their advanced care plans? Because one would think that if those plans are in place, that may be less of a burden that the carer has to bear as well. So I just wonder whether there's a link. Uh, uh, look, I'm not aware of it is, if there is, and I suspect it's too new to be systematic. Okay. Um, the study that I'm... The, the ones that I'm alluding to um, is a very big study in South Australia called the South Australian Omnibus Survey. It's a bit like a... A, like a general population survey and everybody pays and you get your questions and, and the ABS type does it. And they asked people a series of questions. Has anybody close to you died in the last five years? Did you regard yourself as a carer of that person? After that, where did they die, blah, blah, blah. After that person died, how long did it take you to move on? Okay. And that was the language was around moving on. And it was, it's very interesting when you see that graph that it starts to close, but it's not for two years. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh, I think I'm correct in, in saying that you were putting the idea that euthanasia is a social problem, yes? Is it possible? I'm thinking, no, I'm, I don't think it's a problem. I actually think we should think about it as a social issue rather than a medical issue. Okay. It's well, a health if, issue. If that's the case, then, I mean, this is sort of like a slippery slope argument in a way. Yep. Um, if it's a social issue, then why would you stick with something like, well, there's an expected death in six to 12 months? If the people who are opting for euthanasia are doing it primarily because they fear this loss of uh, independence, yep. then why not just go down the line and forget about the six to 12 months, but if people get into a position where they fear loss of independence, why not allow them to... And, and that is exactly my second last point on my slide. <laughs> if we see it as a social issue, then the distinction between the under 12 month prognosis versus over is really one we might question. Exactly. Now I do have a problem when we move into the psychosocial, the mental health issues, and I did get really alarmed by some of the European research. I do get really alarmed by the idea that young women are electing euthanasia because of an eating disorder. I do get really alarmed by people electing euthanasia because they've got a compulsive, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. And that's a whole issue about how do we protect vulnerable people. 
but I have no doubt at all that we should be having a conversation. What happened in Victoria and in New South Wales, everybody's so frightened about it. In the lower house in Victoria, the legislation as drafted gave a life expectancy of 12 months and they couldn't get it through the upper house. And the compromise in the amendment was to reduce life expectancy to six months. But I think, and, and, and of course, what happens then is that the pro-euthanasia lobby say, well, it's not what we wanted, but it's better than nothing and at least it starts the process, which of course is the slippery slope argument that the people who are against it say, see, I told you so. But as I think if we actually had a conversation about it as a social issue, we would potentially come to a more common consensus about what's the way forward, better way forward for us. Yes. Uh, Cathy, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, it was great. Um, I'm sure we're all much better informed about that now. So there's only 100 people here. How do we get the debate out there so people will do better than the sort of thing that you read in the paper about Granny's terrible pain and someone else's at the other extreme. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the problem with a lot of things I talked about today is that the media just doesn't want to cover it. You know, the idea that it'd be a really good idea if we all had an advanced care directive and we actually have had a conversation with our relatives that says, I really value independence over longevity. So I think it's really about all of us starting that conversation and and taking it beyond the health system and taking it beyond euthanasia to being a conversation about what sort of society do we want to be and how do we want to look after people at the end of their life as a demonstration of that. Because I think whilst we keep seeing it through a euthanasia lens, we keep coming back to this polarised debate where there's no, there's no commonality. And in fact, what I think is really interesting is that people at the really extremes of the euthanasia debate, both of them groups really care about what happens to people at the end of life. If they could actually get together, they'd be quite formidable. <laughs> yes. I was struck by something I read just recently, uh, which talked about that we still talk about sunrise and sunset, mm -hmm. even though for 500 years we know the sun does not rise. Yep. Nor does it set. Yep. So within that sort of uh, culture, yep. how are we going to change the narrative around this issue? Well, I think in a part we need to change the narrative by actually pointing to the international <coughs> experience. I mean, the, the whole slippery slope argument, if I go back to what's happening around the world, I think there are some really extreme problems in some countries where there is broad, widespread euthanasia approval. I've read a recent paper which showed in one country, which I'm not going to name, 50% of people didn't even have a reason listed anymore, let alone any paperwork attached. But in most countries, if I go to somewhere back to Oregon, very similar laws to Australia, 1,100 people in 18 years, we don't have evidence of slippery slope. Mm -hmm. We really need to be going back. We're not the first country to be having this conversation. We're not the first country to be having this debate. And we can actually draw on international evidence about how it's working elsewhere. I don't want uh, the sort of legislation that allows us to carry out euthanasia with people with dementia. But I actually think there's a case that if I'm living with protracted motor neurone disease or some other disease, and I want to do that, and I want to go back to another statistic and that I opened up on, 2% of people commit suicide in this country. Some of those would actually come forward into this if we did it right. And if I go back to the previous case that I talked about, the Belgium case of the 100 cases, some of those were denied and they then went on and suicide were alone. So we need to be very careful that we don't think that by saying, no, no, you can't have voluntary euthanasia, people are not going to die. This is really about the values we have as a society. But I don't think it's one we should medicalise because it's about our society and about the social values we have. But I don't think we should minimise the damage if we don't protect vulnerable people. 
You know, Mission Australia last week produced a new report on homeless people. And it showed, it talked about the new generation of older people coming through, including a lot of older women who are going into old age with no financial resources, but also a cohort of older people who've gone guarantor for their kids for their housing and who have in, now themselves ended up homeless. And what we're seeing in some of that extreme stuff internationally is financial implications of treatment, but also financial life really having an impact. We don't want to get there, but we actually have to think about this as a broader social reform about the sort of society we want to be in, as though youth and understand that euthanasia is part and parcel of a bigger conversation rather than the euthanasia conversation. This is how do we want to look after older people at the end of their lives conversation and how do I as an old person, how do I want to live in the last part of my life? Cathy, just following that last point you've made, it did occur to me as you were talking about the focus on the 2,000 and not the 158,000 in Australia. Yep. But you also had that statistic right at the beginning of your presentation about, well, 60,000 of that 160 are in residential aged care yep. and a third of residential aged care die each year. Yep. There's actually a very strong link, I think, between our social view of ageing and our social view of this issue about death. Because pretty obviously, who are the people who die the most? Yep. The old. Yep. And what do we do with them? We put them in homes. Now, I don't want to be too romantic about that either in the sense of, let's go back to the old days. Um, for those who are interested in, you know, there's a fantastic book by a guy called Atul Gawanda and he wrote a book called Being Mortal and he makes a point, an internet, fantastic book for those who want to read it, but he makes a point that when we moved away from being a, a place where everybody stayed at home and people started, kids started to move out, not only the kids liked it, but the parents did too. <laughs> and don't think it's going to happen like that again. <laughs> and it's a really good point. I mean, the other, the other society I'll point to here, because I think it's so interesting, is the Japanese. So they have the longest life expectancy of the, in the world in a culture that's very bound by family familial responsibility. There are now 68,000 people this year in Japan who are over 100. And their children are in their 80s and their grandchildren are in their 60s and their great-grandchildren are in their 40s and their great-great-grandchildren are in their 20s having babies. And they're really now very fearful about actually the complete breakdown of Japanese society because of longevity. So be careful what we wish for. <laughs> yes. Bill. <laughs> Um, I think it's really patchy. The data when we looked at it, and, and Xanthi, my PA, she, she looked at some of that with me. And the data looks really good in the early years, and then what you see is a data drift. After it becomes established, the record keeping goes downhill. I mean, in, in literally one of the countries we looked at with 50% of people now having no known diagnosis even recorded. And that's a bit scary. And that's part of a slippery slope argument. And that's why I'm saying I think we can learn from other countries in shaping the way we want things to work that work for us. One of the things that went big, one of the big items of debate in, in Victoria, and in fact in New South Wales, is what goes on the death certificate. Right? And what actually came, what went through in Victoria finally with an amendment is that the cause of death will be voluntary assisted dying and the secondary cause will be the underlying contributing factor. But even those issues went through an amendment to get there and that's why they took 100 hours and one of the politicians actually collapsed and had to get taken to the hospital. It was all very dramatic. Imagine if we tried to do this for the country. <laughs> But if we assume that the Victorians are going to lead the way, presuming that they don't have too many political help, then we can learn from it. I, what happened in New South Wales, it was one vote. I don't think we should be thinking that this conversation's over. 
South Australia was lost by only one or two as well, I think. Um, WA has got it coming onto the agenda again there. This issue will just keep coming up. And so we have the opportunity to shape it in ways we want. We've got time for one or maybe two more questions. Yes. Um, on the issue of the $60,000 in residential care. Yep. We've had guidelines for palliative care and residential care from 2006. Yep. But the majority of residential care places wouldn't be implementing those guidelines. It would be virtually impossible with current staffing levels. And we still don't really have, uh, what do you call them, set, we don't set mandated pathways, staff, yep. staffing levels in residential care. Yep. Um, I'll repeat the question for those up in the back who we're not hearing. It's not really a question, it's yeah. if we're judged by how we look after people at the end of life, yeah. we are not doing a very good job for those 60,000. Yes, there's a lot of concerns about what happens to people in resi care. And my point about residential care is that there's 60,000 people who are living in residential care at the time of their death, not that they're dying there. And I think we are creating a huge problem with the number of people who at end of life get put into an ambulance, get sent to an emergency department, spend 24 hours or 48 hours in an emergency department and often die there. And we actually have no accurate figures of how many of those 60,000 actually die in residential care nor do we have accurate figures about how many of them receive care with a palliative approach, if not a specialist. We, know, we actually have a fairly good idea how many have a specialist palliative care team coming in, which is quite small. What we don't know is how many people receive care with a palliative approach. But that is really, I think, part of being a death-defying society. But also, really, this whole issue about choices at end of life. Do we really want to be in a nursing home and sent in an ambulance because nobody knows what to do at three o'clock in the morning? They're really big choices for people and for our health system who are just not geared up. Ambulance staff, emergency departments are not geared up for that either. There's nobody who benefits from arrangements that, like that that don't work. I think we might have exhausted the questions, Cathy. Good. It's a really easy topic. We should have exhausted them. Ah, oh, yes. Well, I, think, I think on a Friday afternoon you've done a great job at exhausting them. Yes, uh, well done. Can I ask um, Associate Professor Rob Gordon to come forward and uh, give a vote of thanks to Cathy? Yes. Oh, I think we might just put our hands together again for Cathy. <laughs> So it just comes to me to, to formally thank Cathy for the presentation today. Um, and before I do that, I was just going to make a comment. This is the Alan Owen lecture, and I worked with Alan for almost 20 years as well. And I think for those of us that, that did work with Alan for a long time, um, he's still very much a part of CHSD and of ASRI. People talk to me all the time. Someone came into my office this week and said we were trying to deal with, a, with an issue, and they said, I'm just trying to work out what Alan would do in this situation, and that's not uncommon um, to happen now six years later. And I think the thing that I remember most about Alan is the fact that he dealt with the way that he dealt with his end of life issues, which really did go on for over a decade. And, and I'm constantly thinking about that when, when um, being in the sandwich generation, those sorts of issues come up for me in, in different ways and with friends and colleagues as well. So I think it's a, it's a very, uh, relevant topic in, for the for the Alan Owen lecture um, this year, and the other the other um, comment I was going to make just by way of um, thanking Cathy is that last year Professor David Curry gave this presentation and it was on cancer and issues related to cancer and it was nice to go away thinking if I just don't smoke and don't drink too much and do some exercise, then I'll live forever and I don't need to worry about those sorts of issues. But Cathy's completely ruined that um, path that I've been living with for the last 12 months. But it has been a good year anyway to, to, to have that. So with that, I'll just thank you very much for giving me this presentation. Thank you.
there's something nice in there. I think Kathy could have quite a close look at it in a second. Um, you're very welcome to stay with us. There are some light refreshments that'll be uh, just outside and to mingle. And I'm sure some of you might want to grab Kathy and uh, ask her a few more questions after the presentation. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming. And we hope you've enjoyed the 2017 Alan Owen Lecture. Thank you.